What kind of things did you learn from No ID? He like kind of speaks in these like Yoda like, I mean, he also just is normal and hangs out, but he, sometimes he'll set up a session like he would bring me and like, you know, FKA Twigs and two other people in a room and be kind of like, all right, go, you know? And he'd talk through a lot of it and then he would kind of let us work, you know? And then he would come back and be like that one. And then he'd put some drums on it and kind of finish. But he would say, if you put a bunch of people in a room and, they, and, he, and you come back in the other day and you're like, so how'd it go? And they're like, oh, we made a vibe. He's like, that means you fucked up because you were supposed to make a song. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. We are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. You can catch us every Tuesday, every Thursday on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency. And as you guys know, we love to bring people on who represent the path, the path and the idea of no labels, going their own path, building their own unique journey through this creative industry. And today we have a producer who has all kind of accolades. He's worked with people like Kanye West, Travis Scott, the list go on. He's been on the Spider-Man soundtrack, which is a huge movie at the moment. I have yet to see it, but everybody keeps telling me it's great. Ja'Cory told me like, hey, that thing, yeah, I, I gotta see it. I gotta see it. So we have Johan Lennox with us here today. Um, by the way, you're an artist as well, and, yeah. and we're gonna definitely get into that journey. But first and foremost, let's start with, hey man, appreciate you for pulling up. Yes, sure, thank you. Now, producer doesn't really suit you as cleanly as it fits a lot of different producers, right? Not just because you're a producer and an artist, but if you read a headline with your name on it, sometimes it'll say composer as well, yeah. right? Why composer as opposed to producer? Uh, well, I started um, like doing classical music originally, and I was writing like for orchestras and stuff like that when I was before I even like got into even knowing how to produce or sing or any of that stuff. So I feel like everything I've done since then kind of comes out of that, I guess. But it's also just like the thing that distinguishes me. Like I don't really make beats that much. I, you know, most of what I do is more composing for string instruments or whatever, brass, piano, you know. Gotcha. I, I'll do it on sheet music even, so I think that's the thing that I've like done the most and it's the thing that's most, I guess, unique about me, so. You're still writing sheet music today? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's like programs you can do it on that'll like make it look good, yeah. but yeah, I mean, like all the strings I've done on my own records and on other people's records, and like even when I go on tour, when I have violins on stage, all everyone in all the situations is reading sheet music that I wrote and that's how I don't have to have, like rehearse really and I don't even have to be in the room when I record strings for records because they just read the thing I wrote and it's always correct so it's like I, I, I didn't learn that skill knowing I was going to use it for this type of stuff but it's cool that I I mean it's lucky that I did learn it but it's like I was doing that before I ever got into this type of stuff let's, let's talk about that you started in classical music right yeah and it wasn't just you know I took some violin classes in school and maybe even went on um, to college you went beyond college and actually had a career in classical music for a period of time a little bit but I mean it, it kind of actually started before college like I was in high school I was already getting like paid by orchestras and choirs and stuff to write music for them for their concerts so Oh, you were like a prodigy, man. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I was trying to, there's like a lane that was like that for like classical people especially. There was like a classical prodigy kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Like they love kids doing that stuff. It's just interesting, I guess. Yeah. So I was, yeah, I was like in that kind of lane. And then when I went to college, I got kind of interested in other types of music too. But I, I kept doing that stuff. But I, that's when I started noticing what like Kanye was doing with, his music and just other artists that are like more mainstream, I guess. So when did the, the transition start to happen? Like when did you start moving more into, I guess, the rap, pop, hip hop space? Pretty much as soon as I left school. I, I, it was like, I, I, I had that realization that like the way to bring some of the classical stuff that I really want to do to like a mainstream audience, which is something I've always cared about. Like it always frustrated me, frustrated me how like limited the audience for that music can be and it's mostly like old people it's mostly like a very like traditional kind of audience that isn't that exciting or fresh i guess so i was already thinking about that 
but then kind of yeah like just getting into Kanye especially and just especially the album My Beautiful Dark Crystal Fantasy and I guess Jesus too just seeing like oh you can put music that's that symphonic or that weird into like a much more mainstream space if you have that kind of platform or know how to market stuff or whatever um, so yeah pretty much since I left school I would like move to LA and was just like I'm gonna learn how to produce I'm gonna learn how to sing like it was kind of overnight just starting from scratch and it wasn't like eventually I got in with the string arranging for big artists and stuff like that and the composition and figuring out how to combine those two things and into that part of my career but like initially it was really like just put all that to the side and it was just focusing on songwriting and producing um, which I think was important it was like probably the biggest risk I've ever taken but it was how I'm here so were you finding success with just that before people knew about your strings background I was in like decent rooms as a songwriter first not like great rooms but just you know I was like out here working with a lot of people and like LA is really good for that like there's just a lot of collaboration it's very easy to be like oh like let's get in a session and like pull up whatever um, so that that was happening pretty quickly but I wasn't getting cuts really for a couple of years like I wasn't really able to get like I don't know, it's pretty hard. I mean, especially like pitching songs, which is kind of, I was on the pop side of things a little bit. And you know, you'll do sessions where no, there's no artist in the room. You're just trying to write a song to then send to like Justin Bieber or something, or The Weeknd, you know? He probably writes all his own stuff. But like, that's hard. That's really, really hard to do, you know? It's like almost nothing ever gets made that way. But if you're trying to go that path and you're not in with those big artists, you don't have a choice, you know? So I think, Initially, a lot of those sessions were just about putting in like reps and just kind of learning, writing with different people, learning how songs get put together, I think. How many songs do you feel like, and for those people who are in those type of rooms that have to send it off, how many songs do you feel like get placed out of whatever amount? I mean, one out of hundreds, probably. Well, and there's degrees, too, because it's like you get placed on, I mean, again, we're talking like really pop shit. But I guess it's true for hip hop with beat placements a little bit too, where you might cook up and make a beat together and then you're basically just sending that beat out for a year or two waiting for somebody to bite, you know? But um, like, you know, if you're trying to, being a songwriter, like especially, let's say like pop and R&B, like where, where there really are just people whose job is just to help write lyrics and melodies for other artists, like that job is like the hardest job in the music industry to make money at, I think, because it's like, you can sign a publishing deal off of your potential and then you have that money to live off of until you get a hit. And to get a hit is like, the artist has to like the song, they have to cut the song, they have to put the song on the album, it has to be a single, and then it has to be a hit. It can't just be a single that doesn't, you know? And then at that point, maybe you recoup the advance, you know? Until that happens, you're basically screwed, I think. But you can do like sync stuff. There's, there's like other ways in, but I think that is the hardest. Because at least as a producer, you get, you get an upfront fee for your work, usually, if it's a major artist, whether or not the song does anything, yeah. even if it's an album cut. But just pure songwriting is like, that's it's brutal. Yeah, so you talked about, um, you know, sometimes you can be in these rooms where it, it may just be you and writers, no artists. And I know when I first met you, um, it was working with this, you were working with this artist named Tone the Mailman, and I watched you being active with him in a way where I don't know, it wasn't like the traditional producer situation where y'all were talking more so about just the melodies, but like you were talking him through like personal stuff, you know what I'm saying, that seemed to kind of help him out. Like I remember you saying like, yo bro, like you just seem nervous, like let's go outside, I'll take a break, you know what I'm saying, chill out for a little bit and come back. So do you feel like not having access to artists in that way messes up the ability to get a hit out of them or is it, does it still kind of feel the same whether you have the access or not? I think the really good producers, like I almost never do that. Like you saw me in a hands-on situation with an artist where I was like, I just like him because we're both artists, yeah. but almost never like do I, you know what I mean? Like, I, like most of my time I spend on my own stuff or I'm just doing strings or something on a song that's basically done already. But like that kind of like ground up process from the beginning it's like, it, it's gotta be someone I really like to do that stuff with, you know? And it's like 070 Shake, it's like, you know, Tom the Mailman, whatever. But like, uh, I do think the, the really great producers often are the, one, are the ones who, I guess, don't just make beats, but like are there to really 
I'm gonna say babysit the process maybe, maybe there's a better word for it, but just like they really are making sure all the way through that, that it's like, is that the hook? Is that really the one, you know? Maybe let's start a new idea. Like, like they have a, a, a sound in mind for like what the final product needs to sound like in order to be a big song. And it's not just like, here's the beat, like, thanks. I mean, I think you can definitely have a career doing that, but the real goats are like, yeah, are like, yeah, they're, they're making the, the song exist and kind of watching every step of the process and helping the artist find. I mean, you hear about like Jack Antonoff a lot in the pop world and his production style doesn't necessarily have that much of like a signature sound. Like he kind of, he adapts to the artist a lot. But apparently, and I've never been in a session with him, but all the artists done like, you know, Lord and Taylor stuff, like just big like pop stuff that what they all say, I think, is that he just makes them really comfortable in the room and is able to get them to like tell these stories that are personal to them and write the song they really want to write. And a lot of that is just, has nothing to do with anything that you're doing on a computer. It's just like relationship and psychology and you know, stuff like that. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's interesting. Before we get too deep into specific projects and things you've done, I don't want it to be missed that you said you took that risk moving to LA leaving classical behind for a period of time. Like, what is that like for an artist who moves to LA? Because this is obviously that city of dreams where so many people do that, but I don't really hear too many people go through like, I mean, it's like I'm finding a crib. Do you immediately reach out to maybe management or like how do you even figure out your way through the process? Um, yeah, it was terrifying. It was like, yeah, the, the, the scariest thing, I'm very like risk averse in general, I think. Um, and the scariest part of that was definitely just not, like, like I had some momentum with the classical stuff and just being like, I'm gonna not pursue that right now. Like it felt like sacrificing him and I had spent like years building up a little bit. Even though I wasn't like, fuck you everybody, I'm out. You know, it's like, like I could always go back, but it's like, you know, you're, you're really shifting completely and sort of stop, you know what I mean? Like, that, that felt like a huge risk. But yeah, I mean, living in LA, I guess the way I did it was, I was actually in New York for like several months before that. Like right out of school, I was in New York. I was thinking about that, how I had friends in New York. I'm from the Northeast, so it's like, it made that seem like the place to go. But I already had in my mind, maybe I'll have to be bi-coastal here in LA. I knew LA was important for like a lot of the music that I'm interested in. Um, but basically what I did was I just, I, I went out to LA a couple times for like a week each and just like really try to pack those weeks with like as many random meetings or sessions or it was more meetings really at the time because I hadn't even really done that much sessions but I was just like before I like moved to LA I was kind of like I was trying to see what was up and see if it was even possible to like do that I guess and so it was a lot of the randomest kind of shit really of just like well like that dude's cousin's sister like is dating an artist who signed a like pitbull or something so that sounds legit i guess and he met with me you know over lunch and just gave me some advice you know most of that shit didn't go, go anywhere i met with a few people who worked i was i mean i was lucky that i wasn't connected in the sense that i didn't know anybody in the music industry at all but like i was a few degrees out from people who knew people mainly at publishers like low level A and R's at publishers, and I met like two or three of those, and one of them was just interested enough, just based off of kind of the classical stuff I had done, that they were like, I think it happened that it was a dude named Andrew Gould at uh, BMG at the time. Uh, I think he's at like Rock Nation now or something like that. But he, um, he, uh, I think we just connected on like we were both from Massachusetts, and he also played piano growing up. I really think that's what happened, you know, because I had like eight or ten meetings that were probably equal or worse than that. But the reason he kept fucking with me and started introducing me to people, I think, was just those two things were just kind of like, he's like, oh, okay, I kind of see myself in this dude a little bit, maybe, something like that, you know? Which is luck, but I do think a lot of times that's what happens, right? And so then with, with that relationship, I mean, I kept trying to do it in New York for like a few more months, and then it kind of with that, I was kind of like, I'm getting more traction in LA. And traction really just meant like meeting people. Like I wasn't, again, like getting cuts or making any kind of money on that. I was still, basically just funding it using like, or like paying my rent using the money I had saved up and the money I was making just off of the classical stuff, which wasn't much, you know? Yeah. And I was living on like an air mattress and shit. Like it wasn't, you know, like, I, I definitely had to like rough it for a bit. I like that you did those test runs though, coming out. I'm just, I, I'm not gonna do anything without feeling like there's precedent for it or there's evidence that there's some, you know, I'm just very, 
like I said, kind of risk averse in that way. But I felt like that was the only way to, like I felt like I had to come out here, but I just, I'd, I'd maybe been here once before that and I just didn't know anybody. So I was just kind of like, I'm not just gonna move. I'm gonna at least see what's possible. Let's talk about the fact that most artists fail to understand that it doesn't take forever to monetize your audience. We had an artist literally begin to take off and make $20,000 from his brand new audience in the same month. But how is that possible? It's because we're in a new era, baby. Yes, you wanna to continue to build a relationship over time, but the first time you make money from your audience can happen today if you understand the new age music marketing funnel for artists. So if you wanna hear about this approach and how you can apply it to yourself, I made a completely free video to watch at www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash monetize. You gotta make sure you put the www or if you're on YouTube, you can find the link in the description and check out how we help monetize artists for completely free. I promise it'll completely change how you see things. Yeah, man. So one thing I, I, I wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned just coming from classical space, right? This is a genre that's traditionally seen, or traditionally is dominated by, I guess, the, classical, the older artists for a sense, right? Have you ever thought about labeling yourself as a classical music artist, but still keeping your sound and just seeing if you can kind of come in and like revamp the space? Like, is it, uh, and I guess one, have you thought about that? And two, from your knowledge of the space, is that something that even seems to be possible? Um, I mean, I think there's some aspects of that that are kind of interesting. Uh, like, you think about like Lil Nas X putting that song out and labeling it as country, and then it stood out and it kind of became this debate about like, what is this country? And I am very interested in that um, idea. Like I put out an album last year that had like Danny Brown and 645 AR and like fucking like, you know, a bunch of uncredited features, but like oh, Casey Hill from Good Music, like a lot of random features on it, but it was really a classical album that just had vocals and it kind of, it, it's kind of hard to describe. You kind of just have to hear it. It's a very weird project. And I collaborated with a bunch of classical people on that. And I, I was pretty adamant that we labeled that classical. And that, but I, I sort of have like, I mean, if you want to get really into this, like, I, I think of classical music as, as, like, having certain values, and I think of, like, pop and hip-hop music as having their own sets of values and stuff like that, and I bring classical elements into my, like, vocal, mu the music I sing, like, the pop music stuff that I do, and obviously into my production for other rappers and singers, um, I add strings and stuff like that. But to me, it's like those records are not, no matter how much of that you put in because of the format and because of how it's intended to be listened to, like what context it's supposed to be used in, it's not classical music, no matter how much of that you put in, you know? Yeah. And then I, and I think classical music can be classical music no matter, like you can put eight or 10 rappers and singers on a classical project, which is what I did, but it's still classical to me because it was like basically the way it's meant to be listened to and the way it was written, it's not for the club. It's not for, you know, yeah. like it's, it's, it, it's still, it's like the values and the context that it's for, I think, that make it what it is. So that I labeled as classical. I'm putting out a classical album later this year that's just string quartet music and stuff like that, but I put like modern production techniques like distortion and delay and like stuff, modulation, whatever, stuff like that on it. But I'm labeling that a classical album. And so it's like I'm interested in messing with both sides of it and being like, well, what if a classical album did have a rapper on it? What if it did have distortion on the cello part or something like that? But I still think they're kind of for different. And then I do want to bring people over to this, to the classical side of things as an audience, but I still think it's like the format and the presentation. Like I think, I think the genre, the boundaries are like actually helpful kind of, and it's more interesting to work within them than to kind of. Can you elaborate on those boundaries for classical as you yeah. see them? And then obviously the values that you say you saw in hip hop? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, part of it's just like what a song is. Like I think a song, like I don't hear, like I want classical music to be like a huge deal in America or something. This is like my big, big ambition in the long term. Like I don't see that as being like, oh, suddenly we have like three minute classical songs on the radio. Because that's not what it's for. You know what I mean? To me, classical music lives in a space where it's like, I want to go sit in a room. I think it's better live for the most part, but I want to go sit in a room and experience some crazy shit. To me, that it's like it lives in the same lane as like Cirque du Soleil or something to me at its best, you know, or like operas or like musicals, a little bit of that. It's like, I'm gonna sit down and this is gonna be crazy for two hours or whatever, you know. Like, to me that's very different from like, songs that exist on playlists or songs, you know, like, just obviously most music 
in the pop and hip hop space is driven by like lyrics and stuff like that. It's about understanding what they're talking about, the story like that. I think classical music can be a lot more about just like open ended, letting you kind of interpret it how you want and run with that. I think there's just ways that they kind of operate that are kind of different. I mean, I do think there's aspects of pop and hip hop music that are close to operating the way classical does. Like certainly if you think like like the Mike Dean like synth album or something like that or like some of like the Flying Lotus stuff or something like that is like, it's, it's definitely more in that like, let me trip out, let me just experience this as like a long-term kind of thing. Less about like, where's the hook, where's the verse at, you know, stuff like that, I guess. But those are both valid types of music. I just don't think, like the, the, you, you can put as much classical as you want into a song that has a verse and a chorus, it's still gonna be a song, like a pop song to me, you know, or a hip hop song. It's like, and so I, sometimes that, like, people are like, oh, you're like combining the two. And I'm like, I don't really see it that way. I think I'm bringing elements of some into one world or and vice versa. But I don't think that there's such a thing as like a, I don't know what the word would be, like a genre hybrid of the two. Because I just think it's like, well, which is it? Like, how am I supposed, where is this for? How is this supposed to be consumed? I think that stuff is kind of interesting. Yeah, like, is that even a, a model for you to follow in this space? Or Because it, it, it kind of looks like from the outside looking in, like, you're building the, the marketplace <laughs> for that type of I'm music. I'm trying to. And, yeah, yeah, and there's been interesting versions of that. Like, I went on tour last year opening for 070 Shake, who's like a rapper singer, and that was like her whole US tour open for that. And she wanted me to, on a couple of the shows, I did like my set, and then she wanted me to do like just a classical set also, you know, because there was only one opener and we had a lot of time to fill, mainly, but also she just loves that I do that. And that was really interesting because you have all these people who came to a show who know her lyrics who might be like drunk or whatever because they're at a show. And now I'm just like, okay guys, I'm gonna do like 15 minutes of classical music now. Like, hope that's okay, you know? And it's, but you know, I made it loud and I had like some good lighting and shit going on, hopefully to keep it interesting. But it is like a crazy thing to ask of people. And I, I've been enjoying that. And I mean, a lot of people came up to me and were like, that was my favorite part of the night, period, you know? Which is incredible. And a lot of people probably also were like, what the fuck was that? But it's like, it's okay. Like I'm finding where these people are at. And, and, and taking them into my space. And I do think there's like, you can push these, the boundaries a bit, but yeah, I mean, really I'm trying to just amass a following that will then come to whatever I do, kind of in that, give me that freedom, yeah. When would, you, when would you say things changed for you, right? You had that moment that really brought you into the industry, you started working with bigger artists. Um, there was like a couple steps, I mean, one was, well, yeah, okay, so I did a concert called Yeethoven with a friend of mine that was like, uh, literally we did a bunch of music from Yeezus with a live orchestra, and we did some Beethoven on the same program, and we kind of almost like little miniature like TED Talk vibes of just like in between each thing would just come out and be like, so this is the next thing we're gonna do, you can listen for this and this, this is why they're similar, here we go, you know? And just to help people figure out what was even going on, and people loved that shit, and it was like very viral, kind of for obvious reasons, like you put Kanye plus orchestra in a headline, people love getting mad about us comparing him to Beethoven or whatever for obvious reasons, like, and this is like a few years before, you know, shit really went, you know, uh, left with him, I guess, but uh, in some respects at least. But, um, but that was, uh, no, that was like an awesome thing that we did just for fun that I didn't even know was gonna kind of lead to a lot of opportunities because some of the people I already knew who came out to that suddenly they could be like introducing me to somebody else like yo have you seen this guy he did this thing and it was easier to be like it's just hard when you haven't done anything and I hadn't really done anything in the space that I'm trying to get into at the time but at least that was just so audacious and insane and obviously incredibly lucky that I had come out of this background enough where I was connected to people who could get an orchestra together and not have to like it's like an existing organization like no one had to pay like we weren't paying out of pocket for this it was just a is a friend of mine was employed at this orchestra that existed and he was just like, I wanna do something crazy. And it's like, I was like, what if we do this, you know? So, so, so it's like that, I got lucky in that sense, but, and I got kind of lucky because it was actually his idea originally, my friend would just be like, well, I would love to do something like Kanye's music. And then I kind of came up with a lot of what the idea ended up being and did the music with him. But he was the one who had an orchestra that he had access to and like, that's obviously insanely lucky. But yeah, so like that, uh, that um, opportunity basically led to me meeting uh, Vic Mensa was kind of the first artist because his management at the time was the dude David Appleton was co-managing him with like Scooter Braun, this other dude Cody. And so I met Scooter briefly and I met Vic and they were just like, oh, you should do strings for Vic. 
and he did this cool kind of thing, you know, whatever. So that was just like, that was the first one in. And Vic is the nicest dude in the world. So Vic really took care of me and just kind of introduced me to No ID. And it, like later we were doing like Travis Barker stuff for a second. He was doing like pop punk type music. And so through Travis, I met some people. Through No ID, I met some people. And then also around that time, Mike Dean followed me on Twitter also because of that concert, because somebody had tagged him because it's like we did his like guitar solo in the orchestra, you know, version. And somebody was just like, oh, this is Mike Dean, it's so crazy. And so he followed me and then I, you know, I hit him and he was working with Vic at the same time. So it was at two points of like, okay, this guy's legit or whatever. And then that's when things started to kind of happen and Mike brought me in on Kanye stuff and Astroworld and all that. So that's kind of when that all happened. And then after that, it was a lot easier. That's crazy because, you know, a lot of times people are trying to get attention in the industry or fans, whatever. And you're thinking like, oh, I got to create some music like for my project or have a song blow up, have a, I don't know, get a couple of connections, whatever. There's all these typical routes. But the lesson in what you did to me is just create a spectacle. You know yeah, I mean? which which is hard to do cheaply, but there's you know a lot right. of people. But I think most people I've seen do it successfully do it on the internet. Yeah, just come up with some viral thing. Yeah, that you just, you know and just really lean into that aspect of it. But it's hard. Everybody's trying to go viral right now. And but like, it also shows your talent too, right? So sure. I feel like something like that it only has to go but so viral because the people can see your talent in it. It's yeah. not something that you know I don't know you smashing a, a, some glass sure. and everybody's sharing it. That's but what, what what happens to it, right? So I think that was, it's pretty cool. And I think that, I mean, I don't know what other people's version for that is. I think covers in general kind of work that way. I mean, oh, there's a lot of people doing a lot of covers, but if somebody, like what we had was like the benefit of people clicking on something because Kanye's name is on it. And then they get rewarded by seeing something cool that's good, you know? Yeah. And it's like, if yeah, if you do a cover of a song and you flipped it in an interesting way, I don't think it's that hard. Like if you do a bunch of that stuff, like to get one off and like, People fuck with you now because they found you through just basically searching shit related to that artist or something. Like, I think that's kind of the same shit, basically. You know? Yeah. And then it's like, oh, you did your thing on this, and it's like. But I feel like covers go viral a lot, at least on TikTok and shit, you know? Like, on YouTube too. Like, there's a lot of artists that came up just doing covers of stuff first. And just yeah, a whole lot. Damn, whole his lot. version of that song is totally different from what I expected. And like, yeah. I mean, fucking even Frank did it, really. Remember, like, he did a tape that was basically just covers, right? You know what I mean? Like, it may, it may be that he didn't need it, but there might, it may be that covering Coldplay and stuff like that, there, that was what he was trying to do a little bit. You know what I mean? I don't know. Okay. So, I mean, you get into these rooms, like, things start to click for you. What was it like, just at first in general? Like, was this, like, relief? I'm official now. Yeah, it was really exciting, obviously. I mean, meeting a lot of big artists pretty fast was, was exciting. But, I mean, the focus has always been the artist stuff for me because, like, there's not that many examples of producers whose career is, like, I guess, I guess who have just such a big platform as a personality, I guess, that they can just be like, now I'm doing an orchestra concert, who's coming, you know? Yeah. There's not, like, how many producers could really do that? Like, Kenny Beats could probably do it. Mike Dean could probably do it. Timbaland could do it. Metro could do it for sure. Metro's the best example, really. Rick Rubin could maybe do it, you know? Maybe, I don't know, you know what I mean? It's like hard, that's a lot to add. Like people, like your fans when you're a big producer and you build a following are basically just other producers and other musicians and stuff. And I do have a lot of that. And there's some truth, like you can build. It's kind of interesting actually, I went on tour in Europe earlier this year opening for this like prog rock band called Polyphia that's like huge on the internet. I don't know. It's like I'd never heard of them, but they're they're huge. And their fans are like mostly like they play guitar really good. Like there's just there's one dude who you probably see on Instagram stuff. He's just constantly like shredding, just like the fastest, craziest guitar player you've ever seen in your life. And they make great music. Um, but like uh, a lot of their fans come to the shows like with guitars to get signed at the end of the show. You know, like they have a lot of musicians they're following and they've managed to just build that big enough that that you know, and then there's other people who aren't that, but it's like that was a, a glimpse into like maybe it is possible to just build a fan base off of aspiring musicians or something, but I definitely wouldn't want to be limited to that. And the artist stuff was always the focus for me. So I guess I felt like that was going to be like helpful, which it has been having the production credits and the connections there. And it's like kind of how I got a lot of the features on my album and stuff is through relationships, through producing and stuff. 
but that's always been the focus. So I guess I never felt like, oh, I've made it, because it's like, I mean, I'm not broke anymore. That part was amazing, but, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but like, but no, nah, I mean, I'm still very much in like, I feel like I'm at, on the ground level still. Do you want to more so leave the production behind at some point? Or, you know, how Kanye, when he did his transition, by and large, he's still a producer. Yeah. But it's very artist heavy in terms of brain and how people think of him. Do you want to go that far Definitely, or do you yeah, want yeah. to balance it, Dr. Dre? So, no, I see, I see him as the model. But, but it's also like there's this third thing, which is the composition aspect, the composing, which is like, I guess maybe that's like him doing fashion or something. It's just like a whole other thing that doesn't even really intersect with either one. But it's like the amount of beats Kanye is making for other artists these days, it's like it's got to be like at most 10% of his time. And I think that, that feels about right to me. I could do a little bit more, but it's not, you know, but there's also like you could do composing for TV and movies and stuff like that. It's like, is that count as producing? Maybe because there is producing involved. But in terms of just like being in sessions with other artists, trying to get them a record like that's it's fun when it's somebody I love or that I just, you know, personally or love their music like 070 Shake, like I said, or Tom the Mailman. But like the list is very short and like really I'm not. I'm not driven in the way some producers are by just the pure adrenaline of trying to get a huge artist to, to put your single out. Yeah. I dabble. Like, I did three days with this artist, Jess Glynn, who's like a huge pop star in the UK, and she's had like, I think, one or two big ones here. And that's like so far from the type of music I normally listen to or make. But I enjoyed just having three days with her and another producer named uh, Roy Lenzo. And we just like, made three songs and I'm pretty sure all three made the album and one's a single or something like that. I mean, I guess we'll see exactly what it looks like, but like that, that was a very satisfying way to do that. I would not want to do 200 days of that a year, you know, but three days of just like a great artist who gets real radio hits, who has an incredible voice, you know, and we just went in just like, we're just going to deliver some, some really pro shit here and I'm going to make these three days count and then I'm going to go back to doing my shit for the next three months, you know? Yeah. So, so how do you balance the, uh, like the creative energy management? Because I, I can assume there has to be a point where you may be sitting in these sessions and possibly feeling like, hey, I don't, I don't want to burn myself out creatively so that when it's time to work on my stuff, I have nothing. Or, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm giving away my best ideas the majority yeah. of the time. And then when I go back to my stuff, I don't have anything. So like, how, do you, how do you balance that? Yeah, well, th those sessions were good just because it's like, it's so far from anything I would ever do for myself yeah. that it kind of just felt like a break from stuff. To, and I do a lot of different things, you know, like I, right now I mentioned it earlier, uh, or like before we started, I was talking about how I'm working on like some live event, like experiential party shit. And that's a lot of work. And it's kind of like a lot of logistical work, which is annoying in its own way. But it's, it's a good break from all that stuff because it's a completely different part of my brain. And then, then you know, I got to do some string arrangements for artists. And then I got to figure out my social media plan for the album and then I gotta go make, you know, it's like by the time I've done all that and I come back to my own stuff, it's like, oh, thank God, you know? So it's like just having a range of different activities I think makes me feel like I'm always on some different shit, which is exciting. But also like working with, like, like I'll always go do the 070 Shake session because she's like basically my favorite artist and that recharges me creatively because I'm just living in her space and hearing where she's at and what she's getting excited about musically gives me inspiration to make shit. And it's not like I'm making stuff that sounds like her, but just even seeing what she's into and, and understanding her taste even better, it's just like, you know, it'd be, it'd be like the same. I work with Kanye very briefly, but like, it'd be like the same thing. Just imagine just being in a session with Kanye for like three months and just being like, wow, I really know what this dude, you know, assuming you were really on, you know, like work, like working hard and, and really focused, like, now you know how the greatest artist of all time like thinks basically you know and i learned a lot from no id that way too like almost nothing i worked on with no id ever came out but i learned so much about how he makes music and stuff that those sessions are just like a vacation pretty much you know what kind of things did you learn from no id there's so much shit. i mean he like kind of speaks in these like yoda like i mean he also just is normal and hangs out but he has so many things that he says that are just the most quotable pieces of like wisdom that you would you know uh Shit, I mean, there's one that I love saying a lot. That he, I told him this like after I was like, you remember saying this? He's like, no, nah, I don't know. He just says shit, you know? But he said, he said, I hate when, like, because sometimes he'll set up a session like he would bring me and like, you know, FKA Twigs and two other people in a room and be kind of like, all right, go, you know? And he'd talk through a lot of it and then he would kind of let us work, you know? And then he would come back and be like that one and then he'd put some drums on it and kind of finish, you know? 
but he would say, if you put a bunch of people in a room and, they, and, he, and you come back at the end of the day and you're like, so how'd it go? And they're like, oh, we made a vibe. He's like, that means you fucked up because you were supposed to make a song. <laughs> 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 but like, I interpreted it just be like, well, also people always make a vibe, but it's like, you know, like really like a song. And it kind of speaks to what I was saying earlier, which is a song is not just like, oh, this is, this is kind of cool, you know? Like a song has like a, a hook. It has like a structure, you know? It's like, it has some sort of intention, some focus to it, you know? And I kind of respect that at that level, for the most part, he wasn't even going to bother putting the drums on the song until there was a song, you know? Because the drums aren't, I think, for, for like one of the greatest drum producers of all time, I think it was kind of interesting that he recognized that like, it's not the drums that are making this what it is. It's the, it's the vocal. Because it's a song. It's, you want to hear, and this is what, we did a lot of R&B stuff together especially, but like, you know, I, most people out there are going to be like, what are they singing about? Is this like, is this catchy, you know? That's the thing, you know? And the drums are very important, obviously, and he can make anything fire, but it's not, no amount of good no ID beats matter if the song isn't there. Yeah, that is interesting to be that successful, but then still understand where you play your role. Did, have you seen that? Just, you know, not necessarily names, just people, that, as you've navigated the industry, experienced people who had different levels of success. Is that like a common thing that we're, the ones that really seem to be locked in, understand exactly what they provide. Yeah, and I think also, I mean, it kind of speaks to what we were talking about earlier, which is just like the really great producers know that there's no, there's no career without the songs getting cut and the song being a good song, you know? Yeah. And they, they structure their process increasingly, I find. Even the ones that start as beat makers, the ones that really become big producers, structure how they work around the goal of getting a good song. It's not just, you know, well, I did my thing on this beat and that my job is over, you know? Yeah. I mean, I guess there are probably really big beat makers that just do that, but the people, when I think of producer, I'm thinking like someone who really makes sure that whatever that needs to happen for the artist to do their thing happens, you know? Whether they're just bringing in another songwriter, like, oh, these two might work together, thinking that way. No idea, like I said, putting people together, matchmaking kind of in that way. That's like such a big part. I mean, Rick Rubin, doesn't really make beats even, I think, anymore or whatever. He pretty much just like, he's just listening. He's finding interesting people, putting with interesting people, listening and just being like, I think the tempo on that could be a little faster, you know, and that's it, you know? But knowing and having with 100% confidence that that's what that needs or else it's not gonna be the hit that it could be, you know? What was it like working on Spider-Man? It was hectic. I mean, I, it was between two tours that I was on, and it was basically like Metro had just come off the Coachella set. And I think I texted him because a lot of people were blowing up my phone from that because his whole set started with just like an acapella of my vocals because that's how his Heroes and Villains started, and he just that's how he started. So people were just like, that's, that's Johan, and it was sick. So I just was like, oh, that's awesome. I, I didn't go, but I just was hearing people sending me videos and shit. So I texted him. I was like, yo, thanks. That's awesome, you know? And he was just like, yeah, it's... Uh, sick like I'm back in LA it's like Spider-Verse time so I was like all right cool so then he hit me like a week later and he's just like just pull up to the studio and like actually you know what it's probably like the day after that I think it was literally he came back from Coachella the next day it was kind of like okay cool this is this is what the album sounds like these songs I think could use some orchestration these could use some outros whatever some vocal stuff whatever you want to do and then just gave me bounces of the the four that I worked on that that was actually a pretty good because sometimes it's like I'll work on a lot of ideas and you don't know what's going to get used but that was like he really knew which four and I worked on all of them and did stuff on all of them and all of it. Not everything I did got used. I tend to like, so that like additional production side of what I do, it's very like, I throw a lot at the wall and just see what sticks kind of thing. Like I gave him like, you know, you could have these like, this big melody here. You could have this outro here. You could also have this thing over on this bridge. I'm going to add this other section. You know, just like, here's all of it. And then usually like, you know, maybe a quarter of that gets used or something like that. But it's just giving the option so you don't have to keep going back and forth too much and just making it so there's something in there that he's going to gravitate. And increasingly, like, seeing what he uses also makes it easier just to be like, this is what he likes, you know? Like, just do more of that or something. But then still pushing it. And, uh, yeah, so, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, I saw, I guess I was in with him and Don Tolliver for one of them. But, yeah, mostly I was adding to stuff that was, like, pretty finished and kind of just just did my thing and then came back a week later, played it for him, and he was just like, yeah, this is fire. I just gave him everything, yeah tracking strings and a lot of, I stack my vocals up to make this kind of choir texture on a lot of stuff. And a lot of that, you can see it on my TikTok, I've been posting videos recently just like showing exactly what I did and how I did it. But 
Yeah, very smooth process. He's he's like really a professional, you know. Doesn't fuck around. Are producers cool with that these days? You see more and more of them giving insight into the process. Uh, is that There's a range, I guess. Yeah, I mean, apparently the Kanye stuff that I posted is not necessarily like, I guess he really doesn't like that shit. But on the other hand, like, I mean, I've asked sometimes permission, but I think people are pretty cool with it. I, I think it's a good question. And I'm not totally sure, but I mean, I've done it enough that I kind of just feel like whatever. I don't know. Like, what's, I'll take it down if they ask, but yeah. from a legal perspective, I don't think there's any issue. I don't think, but yeah, I guess who gives a shit? But like, I think it's more just like I wouldn't want to offend anybody, you know? Yeah. But I try to just be very gracious in the videos of just being like, this is who, you know, just talking about how good the person who brought me in on the project is, which is usually true. And like, um, yeah, I don't know. It's not like the spirit of leaking it or trying to like... Well, yeah, it's like I don't have their stems. So it's like everything I'm showing is stuff that I did. Because yeah. I don't usually... I mean, people ask me if I want stems of the song to work on it. And I don't usually want that because it's a lot of files. Like, I prefer to just take the, the song, just literally one track, and just add my shit on top. So it's like I'm not exposing anything that he did, I guess. I think maybe that's how I would distinguish it. Is like I'm not like, oh, here's what Metro's snare sound like here, you know? It's like, here's the song, you know? Yeah. And then here's my shit, which I did. So I guess I don't feel as weird about that. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you were working with Metro and you might send a bunch of tracks and then he pulls 25% of it. And then over time, you essentially learn his taste, right? Yeah. And I imagine you do that with multiple people. From a creative side, if you're the producer or you're the artist, it makes me wonder, does that create some type of risk for a producer or artist to get stuck in a creative rut if everybody you're working with over time, with goodwill, starts to send you things that already fit your current taste and then you start to lose exposure to other people? I creatives? try to balance it. I mean, I think I always do stuff that's out of the box of what these artists like, but it's good to just know that I guess it's like if I'm giving them four options, at least two of those are going to be the shit that I know they like. Okay. Yeah, Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Like, I just don't. It's also, there's been funny stuff where it's like over the years, not with Metro at all, but like there's been producers where it's like they like bring me in and they're like, I want you to go crazy. Like, just do the craziest shit you can come up with. And then I do that and they're kind of like, yeah. And then I just do the most normal shit that's what everybody always wants. And they're like, that's crazy. You know? <laughs> So it's like, I think that sometimes, I think the way actually I kind of think of the string stuff is that like what I'm bringing to that is already crazy because of the context it's in. You know what I mean? It's crazy to have strings on this, on this type of record. That's what's crazy about it. The strings themselves don't need to be crazy. They just need to be strings, you know? It's the combination, you know what I mean? It's, and so I feel like a lot of times, and I've, I feel like I've told other people who do that kind of work that advice too, where it's like they come in and they're like, time to show off what I can do. And it's like, you realize like, you're not the star here, you know? You're like adding one piece to the puzzle and your job is to just do that piece well, you know? So it's like, I find that I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't feel super weird about like just kind of doing the thing that's expected sometimes with that type of shit. And sometimes I'll throw some weird stuff in there, but generally it's the stuff that's expected that kind of gets used for that. And it's what's unexpected is just bringing me in at all. That's the thing that was the interesting choice from then. And then I can just do, do what I know I do well and just kind of execute, you know. Got you, got you. You ever feel pushback from you becoming an artist? Maybe from your producer friends or I don't know if you have management or anything like that? Well, it's, I, I was kind of always, that was always the main thing. I mean, I just kind of got successful at producing first. I guess kind of the same thing as Kanye. Like Kanye was always trying to be a rapper, you know? It's just, he just got successful at one thing first and that's kind of what happened with me too. Um, so, I think I've been pretty clear about that. But I mean, the one thing that kind of sucks, I guess, is just like, I mean, engagement on social media, all that shit is tricky because it's like, you cultivate a fan base. Like Marshmallow I worked with reposted something one time that we did together and I got like 5,000 new followers who only want to see shit about Marshmallow, probably. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And like you hope that you pull a couple of those into real fans, but essentially like if they don't understand what they're looking at, they don't react and then Instagram never shows them your shit again. 
I didn't think about that. So I have a lot of like dead weight followers. Uh, if like if you look at my engagement, I mean everyone's engagement sucks right now, but like it looks like it's like oh did you like pay for followers? It's like no, these are just people who like want me to post about the Utopia album or something and don't care, you know. And so I think that part can be kind of frustrating, but I just decided I don't give a shit and I just try to really focus on the people, especially in the DMs. Like I would get a lot of DMs that are like. You know, and I like supporting aspiring producers, stuff like that, but people asking for advice who are themselves musicians who obviously found me because of the work I've done on other records and shit like that. And I try to be responsive to that, but I've tried to really like flag the messages that I get from people who are just fans, who came to the show, who like a lyric of mine or whatever, and just make sure I respond to those people and just kind of slowly like convert the algorithm to favoring that, th that audience and just build, you know, that. That's crazy. I never thought about that. It's, it's, the problem is a little bit more unique than I thought because there's already the path of producer to artist. But like you said on social media, it's not just, hey, I'm a producer. I produce Metro with Metro. I produce with Marshmallow. And now those are two different fan bases and sounds, Yeah. let alone your unique sound as an artist when you start to push that. So you just got a whole kitchen sink of shit on your, your social it's media. It's weird. I mean, I've also just been someone who like, does a wide range of shit and like I like I take pride in the fact that I'm on like a lot of different genres of stuff as a producer and that I'm kind of everywhere and people are always like dude how are you on everything like you're on the R&B shit you're on the indie shit you're on the rap shit you're on the pop shit it's like what and I like that but I think as a if as a producer artist or whatever it would probably be more efficient to just come up with a certain crew of people producing for them and then just also putting myself on the record, you know, and then like kind of come up with them that way. Whereas it's like I have these sort of like not very strong relationships with a lot of artists that I've worked with that mostly aren't going to help my artist stuff at all. They pay the bills, they get me more producer work, which pays the bills. But it's not like, like there's no real upside for me as an artist to having another cut with like, well, say the Jess Glenn example. It's like that, you know, that pop star chick. Like, that's, that doesn't, like, she, I mean, I guess she could take me on tour with her. Maybe that would make sense. But for the most part, she's just in a different lane. Yeah. And so it's not like, yeah, that, like that, it does, it's just, it's more like just the time I commit to that stuff doesn't necessarily help me as an artist really in any direct way other than just getting me paid, I guess, which I can use to do other stuff. But yeah, so I try to minimize it. Now you mentioned going on tour earlier on. What what is that like being an opening act and trying to grab those you know those fans for yourself? Does it even work in your opinion? I think so. I mean, if they come up after me and tell me that you know I get a lot of like that was the best opening act I've ever seen because I go all out for my shit. So that feels good. I think that those people you know they follow me. They they buy the T-shirt. I I think if they've done all that, they're probably. Converted. The most obvious way I saw that the 070 Shake tour paid off was that on the the tab with like the artists your fans also like on Spotify, like we hadn't been on each other's list at all. And after that tour, we, she was the number one person on mine, and I was the number one person on hers too. So it's like that's only there's no other explanation. Like she was featured on a song on my album, but it's like the lowest streaming song on the album because it's just like an interlude and shit. Like the only explanation is that that many people saw us on tour that it literally the entire algorithm shifted just based off of that, that and, and that those people started listening to the music on spotify so that felt pretty pretty legit to me you know but i don't think you can get huge just off of opening for people like it's 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 it makes you a real thing for people who see you and then if they see your song maybe they connect the dots and it's like, oh yeah, I saw that dude on Shake Tour, uh, you know, and he's got this song I love, she's on the album, you know, it's like, but I think it adds to that, yeah, it's, it's not gonna, like, in the end, like, everything blows up on the internet, there's no other way to do it. You said you lose money when you do shows, usually when you open up, why is that? Well, I, I have live strings on every show and they have to get paid, so usually the, the fees I'm getting for opening or whatever, where I don't fee advance, I don't know what they call it, uh, that usually basically just covers that, you know? And maybe a little bit of whatever I'm paying, like a playback sound type person. And then I spend some money to, you know, if, it's, if it's a tour, then it's the traveling. If we're staying at Airbnbs, it's that. 
that being on the bus is way cheaper because you don't have to pay for anyone to drive, you don't have to rent a car, and you don't have to pay for hotels, you know? But if you're, if you're like driving yourself in a crew around the country following a, a bus, which is what we did on the Shake Tour, then, I mean, yeah, it just adds up. You're trying to feed everybody. Even, and you gotta pay everyone for their time, so it's just, yeah. You make some of it back on merch sales, but yeah, it's an investment for sure. What about um, your own personal shows? You said you wanted to do some personal shows in LA to control the experience more. Yeah. What does the experience of Johan Lennox look like in your mind? I mean, I'm working on this concept. I did a couple of them. I did one last year. I think you might have come to that. I can't remember. And then I did one this year, and I'm calling it World's Burning. And it's just like, there's a lot of shit going on in the world, but this is our space, you know, creative people, artistic people to just fucking hang out, get drunk. You know, I have like a string quartet. I make cocktails. I'm obsessed with like mixing drinks. It's like a big hobby of mine and like really good shit. So I do that, have some musical performances, have some DJs, you know, like just, and then in a space that's like immersive, like I'm still working on that aspect of it to really get it where I want, but just like in a room that feels like you've left the planet for like this evening and you're just kind of in a different area. So I always loved like immersive theater. I've always loved like haunted houses, like all that type of shit, you know, escape rooms, whatever it is. Like, I just think that that, that theatrical shit is cool and it's a way to show off maybe what the headline tour would look like once I get there, but on a scale that I can kind of do it and have like, you know, the people that I work with can come see it and then a lot of random people that are fans or whatever in LA can come see it. Um, it just feels more, because it's like when you open up for somebody on a tour or even if you're a headliner on a tour, you got to transport all that shit, you got to pay for how, how that gets set up every night, you know? to totally reimagine the stage, bring your own lighting designer. Like, it's very hard to do that. But in a space in LA where I can just do it, I think I'll be able to really show like the full vision, I think. Yeah, I like the concept of um, like creating shows that people come to see. Yeah. Like, and something like that I feel like fits in that box, right? I was working on this festival years ago before I even started working with artists. And that was one of the like concepts that I, I left with where I felt like theatrical, like really deep immersive experiences would be something that would be cool for more people to do. And now instead of Johan going across the world, like it just becomes so lit and you hype it up so well then people, even if they don't even know you too well, the experience in general would look so cool, like people would come to see you. 100%. And a lot of that's just like, you invite certain people, you make it really Instagram friendly and suddenly it's like, oh, this is like some shit I should have gone to. And I think that happened a little bit with the last one, but I'm gonna I'm gonna really build that up, and uh, and then eventually like maybe just take that on tour, or it's like every show you do on tour, you have an after party that's that thing, or you, or the show itself, you just kind of build the stage setup to kind of reflect that world, or at least like one off pop ups like do it in L A, but also do it in New York, do it in Boston, do it in Chicago, Atlanta, you know, so or like a moving new uh, museum exhibit, how they do those? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. How do you see your community, the Johan Lennox community that you want to build out? I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that there's this, like, a lot of, like, producers and artists and stuff in it. I think visual artists, too, you know, just people that are creative, starting with them. But I think it's just people who want something that's different and that's kind of crazy and, like, not just, it's not just going to be like, oh, I heard that one song. It's going to be people who are, like, in for the whole world that I'm trying to create visually, sonically, the values, you know, the story. I definitely think we have an era of like, people are kind of lonely, people are very disconnected. The world is not feeling that like optimistic, just looking in the future a lot about a lot of shit. And I'm not trying to solve that, but I think at least just providing a space where people can at least like, I don't know, cope with it, or at least just sort of, sometimes it's like laughing about it too, you know, just like, Fuck it, you know? <laughs> One last question before we get out of here. I would love to know your perspective on what do you think when you hear the term no labels necessary? I mean, it definitely is like a thing that I think about a lot or an idea that I think about a lot, which is just like, there's really no path for what I want to do. 
because no one's ever done what I want to do, the shit with classical, especially as an end goal maybe. And it's, it can be easy to, I think it's good to come up with a community. Obviously a lot of artists do that and I think that is a huge way that a lot of music gets successful is that like a group of people are pushing it and then their fans, you know, kind of rally around all of them. Usually there's like one or two that really break out of that and go all the way with it. But once you look at people that kind of got to the top, there's really like no path that's consistent. Like not a single person that didn't have some very weird path that, you know? And so I think it's good to just not, yeah, like be concerned so much about how it's labeled or how it's packaged or where it fits. I, I think some of that is helpful. Like it's good to just understand like what the lanes even are, but, and I maybe could be better at that, but it's just like, in the end, I'm just doing my own fucking thing and like, I don't know, I'm just trying to figure out, like you look like, maybe I could take a little bit of that. Maybe I could learn a little bit from here. But there's really no like clear kind of, kind of path or brand or label that is like gonna, I mean, I'm speaking like that way, like labels, like, yeah, I guess it also has the literal meaning of like a label. No, it's a, it's a double, a triple entendre, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I was on a label for a minute. My, my, I had, did a couple EPs under Island Records, and that was kind of interesting. And then these days I do, I'm independent um, through a district called One RPM. And I would say they've been just as good, if not better in some ways. Like, it's just, and budgets are kind of the same, honestly, as a major label, at least for me. Like, been able to figure that part out. My manager's really good at just explaining the vision to places and helping them understand why they should invest in me and, like, I definitely don't think, just since I'm talking about it now, like that actual labels are necessary either. Like I just, I, everyone knows that now, but maybe at the very end of the path, you want to get something, just blast it all over top 40 radio. That's where that comes in. But up until that point, like it's just you and your team, I think building whether you're signed or not. And I don't think there's anything wrong with signing, but if you don't need to, I, why bother? I think, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I'll say that's one of my favorite answers to that question so far, because although there is the obvious comparison that most people will assume because we're in music um, about music labels, record labels, the heart of the statement is actually for us a lot more what you said about no specific path yeah. and uh, that entire spiel right there. So, man, appreciate you having you uh, have have I mean, appreciate you hopping on, man, dropping your wisdom, your experience. I think people are going to get a lot of value out of it. Um, everybody, this is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary podcast. I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. I'm Yohan Lennox. And yeah, thank you. And we out. Peace. Appreciate you for watching. If you like content like this, you'll love seeing our music marketing strategies that we use as an agency to actually blow up artists to millions and even billions of streams that are available for free at nolabelsnecessary.com. And the cool part about it that's going to really make you love it is we don't have to be all entertaining and add all this fluff just to get some views that we do on YouTube. We get straight to the information. There's play by play in courses that give you a breakdown of every step that you should do to get success. And you have the ability to have communication with us. We get on live talks, a lot of cool things for members, and it's free just to hop in. So check it out right now at nolabelsnecessary.com.